Okay, wonderful. So this is our first panel of the day. It's on utilizing research. And we'll have each of these three wonderful speakers coming up um, individually. And then we'll have a Q&A together at the end. Um, so I'm going to introduce all of them. And then uh, they'll come up in order on their own. So first, we're going to have Nick Cooney. Um, Nick Cooney serves as Executive Vice President of Mercy for Animals, overseeing MFA's advocacy efforts, corporate outreach, and fundraising. Nick is also the author of several books, including Change of Heart, What Psychology Can Teach Us About Spreading Social Change. He has lectured on effective advocacy across the US and Europe, and hundreds of media outlets have spotlighted his work. Our second speaker is going to be Crystal Caldwell, um, she is the statistician analyst um, for Mercy for Animals, where she is responsible for research, data analysis, and testing to ensure that their programs and activities are as effective as possible. Mercy for Animals, um, which both of these two work at, is an international nonprofit dedicated to preventing cruelty to farmed animals and promoting compassionate food choices and policies. And then finally, we'll have Bobby McDonald. Um, Bobby is a PhD student in political science at Stanford University. He studies the behavior of political elites, intergroup cooperation, and vegetarianism using network methods, automated text analysis, and experiments. So without further ado, we have Nick Cooney. All right, how's everyone doing? Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right, so each of us only have 13 minutes, so I'm going to get right into it. Let's talk research. So there's a lot of research that has been done, that is being done, or that will be done around our interactions with animals, our attitudes towards them, our behaviors towards them. And personally, I find nearly all of this research very interesting. In fact, I find it so interesting, I literally wrote a book about a portion of it, the hundreds of studies done on vegetarians and vegetarian eating. But the single biggest lesson that I have learned in doing research first at the Humane League and over the past three years at Mercy for Animals is this. It is that boring research saves animals. Boring research saves animals. It is often the most simple, the most mundane studies that do the most practical good in allowing nonprofits like Mercy for Animals to be more effective and more strategic. I want to give you an analogous example from the for-profit world. So imagine that you owned a car dealership, and one day a grad student came in and said they wanted to work with you to do some research, and you could pick whatever research you wanted done. There's all sorts of interesting studies that you could do, right? So you could look at how self-identity influenced attitudes towards different makes and models. You could look at whether certain theories of buying behavior, consumer buying behavior, turned out to fit with what goes on in a car dealership. But if you're that owner, there's really only one criterion that you're going to look to in deciding what research you want done. And that is not what is most interesting, not what is most novel, not what is going to get published, but what is going to make me the most money. And that could mean really boring studies like does putting a huge American flag out in front of your dealership get more people to come in and buy vehicles? I've actually spoken to people who worked or have worked professionally with car dealerships, and it is this very sort of boring research that they do month in and month out. It's not because they're unintelligent. It's not because they're not creative. It's because they are focused, completely focused, on their bottom line of making as much money as possible. And I would submit to you that those of us who are involved with research or supporting research or doing research for animals, that we should have that same mentality. Now, of course, our bottom line is different, right? It's not to make the most money, but we have a bottom line as well. Our bottom line is to reduce as much animal suffering as we possibly can. So I would submit to you that in thinking about what research to do and how to do it, that we make those decisions not based on what's interesting or what's original or what's going to get published, but what is going to do the most practical good for animals. And from our experience at Mercy for Animals, again, we found that it's very simple, basic stuff, boring stuff, that often has the most pragmatic value in allowing us to make more effective decisions and do more good for animals. So specifically, we found things like A-B split tests, easy data analysis, and simple marketing studies have done a huge amount of good at improving our effectiveness. And I want to give you an example from each one of these fields. OK, so first, A-B split tests. So one of the things that Mercy for Animals Education Department does is we run large-scale online advertising campaigns that drive people to landing pages that promote vegetarian eating. 
encouraging people to take a pledge to go vegetarian. And if they do, they get a vegetarian starter guide, they get emails, they get personal support, and so on. And by the way, John and everyone, you'll be happy to hear that we now feature men in our starter guide. <laughs> and I completely agree with what John said earlier. So anyway, we have these landing pages, and one of the things we want to figure out is how can we get more of the visitors to pledge to go vegetarian, to make that commitment, and to get all the resources that we offer. So we do ongoing A-B tests to figure out how we can manipulate elements of the page to increase the percentage of visitors that do just that. So for example, we found that putting that particular photo on the right-hand side boosted the percent of visitors who pledged to go vegetarian by 13%. Using this particular wording, and I know it's in Spanish, we mainly target folks outside of the US with these ads. Uh, using a particular wording versus others boosted uh, pledgers by 6%. This is another landing page we use. Again, do these ongoing split tests, find ways to get more people to make the pledge. Using a video that was uh, dubbed rather than a subtitled version increased the percentage of visitors pledging to go vegetarian by almost 60%. Putting a little Counter down at the bottom, showing the number of people who have pledged total, boosted pledges by 22%. And moving this element from the right-hand side of the page to the left-hand side of the page, boosted pledges by 17%. Now, most of these figures are not that big, right? 5, 10, 15, 20%. But when you add them together, and when you consider the number of people who are coming to these pages, simply doing these A-B split tests has meant that 300,000 more people will pledge to go vegetarian this year than would have had we not done those A-B split tests. And granted, some of those people probably would have gone vegetarian even if they'd never come to our site. Some of them won't follow through, and yeah, and, and so on and so forth. But even if two to three percent of those people actually try to go vegetarian as a result of making that pledge and getting our resources, that means that over one million animals will be spared a lifetime of suffering thanks to these very boring, very basic A-B tests. Another example of this sort of research in action, data analysis. So one of the things that's very important for Mercy for Animals and other nonprofits is social media. It's a great way to spread the content we want to spread, to change attitudes, and to change behaviors. One question that we had, had is, how can we get more people to see this content that we're putting out? How can we make the content go more viral? So we looked at 1,600 Facebook posts from Mercy for Animals and other farmed animal protection organizations. We looked at all the data from Facebook, and then we categorized each of those posts across about 15 or 20 different data points. And then we ran the numbers. And we found some interesting things. For example, we found that using, when we used photos of baby animals versus adult animals, we got 20% more impressions on our posts. We found that when we used fewer than 10 words in the little text box area, we got 30% more impressions. And we found that when we used photos that had both companion animals and farmed animals, as opposed to other types of photos, we boosted impressions by 55%. Now again, these aren't massive, massive differences, but when you combine them, and when you consider the number of people that we and other organizations are reaching with our social media, for Mercy for Animals alone, by implementing these best practices, we'll have people see ProVeg content 500 million more times this year than they would have had we not done this study and implemented the results in our social media strategy. And of course, by sharing these results with other organizations, like we always do, we can extend that impact even further. Third, some simple marketing studies. So one of the pieces of content that Mercy for Animals uses is videos. Uh, and there's different types of videos that we create and share on social media. So for example, we do videos about the vegan lifestyle and vegan food. We do cute videos about rescued farm animals. We do what, we've, what we call uh, comparison pieces where we feature both companion animals and farm animals and show, compare and contrast how we treat the two. And then videos that focus directly on the cruelty. So one of the questions we had is, which of these videos is most effective at getting people to want to reduce their meat consumption? So we did a simple study. We gathered participants through Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform, a few thousand. We showed them one of these videos, and we followed up with them a day later to survey them about their intended diet choices. And one of the things we found is that the comparison videos that had the companion animals and the farmed animals generated more than twice as much intention to change diet compared to the vegan food videos or the cute farmed animal videos. 
Another thing we looked at in this study is what call to action is most effective. So we, all, we want to end, and we do end all these videos, with an encouragement of the viewer to make changes to their diet. And we wanted to see what call to action is most effective. One of the things we found is that ending the video by encouraging people to cut out or cut back on the amount of meat that they eat generated twice as much intention to reduce meat consumption compared to encouraging them to please choose vegan. When you consider the fact that we're going to reach about 150 million view, video views this year, you can see the sort of impact that these increases in persuasiveness have on changing attitudes, on changing behaviors, and on reducing the suffering of farmed animals. All three of these examples I've given come from the field of trying to change attitudes and diets as a way to help farm animals. But of course, there's other ways this same sort of research can be used. So for example, a few other quick examples. Uh, Mercy for Animals, uh, we use the uh, same sort of research approach for the fundraising appeals we do. So we do A-B split tests when we send out solicitation emails. And we found, for example, that using photos of pigs or cows increases the amount of money that people donate relative to using photos of chickens. We do split tests with the subject lines. So every e-newsletter we send out, we test three different subject lines. Whatever one does the best in terms of open rate and click-through rate becomes the subject line for all the remaining recipients. And we do studies around terminology and naming. For example, we partnered with our friends at the Good Food Institute to do a study to figure out what is the best thing to call cultured or lab-grown meat to get consumer acceptance. And we found that of all the names tested, calling the product clean meat generated 20% greater consumer acceptance and interest and perception that food would taste good relative to other terms like cultured meat or lab-grown meat or a few other terms. And of course, all of these other things also contribute to getting us more quickly and more efficiently to that more compassionate world for animals that we want to see. Lastly, there's an a anecdote that I wrote about in one of my books that I often cite in, these, in talks, and it goes like this. There was a leader of an environmental nonprofit who was having an environmental rally. And she's standing up there, and she's, she's got an audience who's very into it, and she says, who here is willing to fight for the environment? And everyone cheers. And who here is willing to get arrested for the environment? And everyone cheers. Who here is willing to dedicate their life to protecting the environment? And everyone cheers. And then she says, and who here is willing to put on a suit and cut their hair for the environment? And the crowd goes silent. Right? <laughs> so my question to you here today is, who here is willing to do boring research to save animals? Let's see hands. All right. Great. On that note, thank you all very much. And if anyone has any questions about the work Mercy for Animals is doing in this area or suggestions of things you think we should do to be more effective, please come up and chat. Thanks very much. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, and thank you, Nick, for basically explaining my day-to-day -day work. Um, and I'm going to talk more specifically about one study that we did to evaluate the online, our online ad campaign, which Nick briefly touched on. So um, as was said earlier, I'm the data analyst at Mercy for Animals, and I work specifically in the education department. And there are many things that we do to try and influence diet and attitudes. We hand out leaflets, we create videos, and we have a very big online presence. And in particular, we have um, an online ad campaign. So what we do is we um, put these ads in um, the Facebook feed. So, you know, while you're scrolling through your Facebook feed, you might see an ad like this come up. And when you click on it, you would be taken to a landing page that has a video about factory farming and an opportunity to sign up for a vegetarian starter guide. And over the next three months, you would be sent um, 15 support emails helping you, um, you know, make your grocery list, talk to your family about these issues, etc. And we reach many, many people with this program. So 170 million people in a given year will see our ads on Facebook. Five million people will click on them, be taken to the landing page, and watch the video. And about two million people will actually sign up and take the pledge, get the vegetarian starter guide, and the 15 support emails. And this is relatively cost effective. So to get people to the landing page to watch the video, that's nine cents per person. To get them to pledge to go vegetarian, that's 25 cents. And comparing that to leafleting at 35 cents per leaflet. But all of these numbers are great. 
They're the very immediate impact that we can easily measure. What's more difficult is knowing whether these online campaigns change individual diet and attitudes. And that's what this study was trying to answer. So in particular, we wanted to know whether people visiting this pro-veg landing page would change their diet and their attitudes. So after people visit this landing page, are they eating differently? Do they think differently about animals? So the general method, which I briefly already touched on, was we targeted people on Facebook, and specifically females aged 14 to 25, and they were recruited once they clicked on this ad. When they clicked on it, they were randomly taken to one of two landing pages. This is the treatment landing page, where, which is you know, just another version of what I showed you before, where they could watch a factory farming video and sign up for a vegetarian starter guide and be sent the emails, or they were taken to a control landing page. And this one uh, talked about um, ending tropical diseases, and then they could take the pledge to help end those diseases. So two to four months later, we then tried to recontact these people on Facebook through a, a Facebook tracking cookie, which I won't go into detail now, but would be happy to talk about more later. Um, and we, show, we put this ad in their newsfeed. And it was seemingly unrelated to MFA, so you know, people in both groups would be just as likely to click on it. Once they clicked on this ad, they were taken to um, a page where they could fill out the survey. The main question that we um, were looking at, the main diet measure, is in the past two days, how many servings have you had of the following foods? And then we looked at these responses and we compared amongst treatment and control group. So the main finding, on the y-axis here, we have servings of food, or sorry, servings of animal products in particular. So this includes meat, eggs, and dairy. And we see, actually see that the treatment group reported eating more servings of meat in the past two days. But this difference was not statistically significant, as you can see. Um, let's see if I can figure out this. So these uh, bars are 95% confidence intervals. Um, and if you, if you, you see the top of this bar, and if it you know, is within this range, then that means that those two did not um, differ at the 95% you know, level, which is the, the standard cutoff. Digging in a bit deeper and looking at specific products, we can see almost across the board that the treatment group did, in fact, report eating a few more servings of animal products. But again, none of these differences were statistically significant. Looking at the data in a little bit of a different way, so we um, basically created two groups, um, one vegetarian and one non-vegetarian. And we defined a vegetarian as somebody who reported zero servings of beef, pork, chicken, and fish. And we see that about 6.7% of people in the control group reported eating zero servings of meat. And about 8.5% of people in the treatment group reported eating zero servings of meat. Again, this difference was not statistically significant, but it, you know, it goes against what I just showed you where um, you know, the treatment group reported eating more servings of meat, but here we see that the, the treatment group is more likely to self-report as vegetarian, and I'll touch more on that later. Um, looking at um, intended future meat consumption, so we asked um, four months from now, how much meat do you intend to be eating? Um, and if we look at these two over here, one is I will probably be eating less meat than I was four months ago and I will probably not be eating at all. We see this blue bar, people who visited the treatment landing page were more likely to say they would be eating less meat or no meat at all. Finally, looking at attitudes. Um, so we asked these three attitudinal questions. Cows, pigs, and chickens are intelligent, emotional individuals with unique personalities. 
um, participants in the control, sorry, the treatment group, which is this top bar here, were more likely to agree with that statement. Um, and they were roughly equal to, equally likely to agree with um, the control group in the other um, attitudinal statement. So to sum all of this up in words, if what I just said um, makes no sense. So participants that visited that pro-veg landing page reported eating slightly more animal products, but at the same time, they were more likely to self-report as vegetarian. They were more likely to intend to eat less animal products in the future, and they were more likely to agree that farmed animals are intelligent and have personalities. However, none of these differences were significant at the P0.05 level. So why did we get these results that seem to conflict with each other and no results that were statistically significant? So I'm going to touch on some of the biggest challenges that we had with this project and with projects <coughs> moving forward. So self-reported diet measures are a very large barrier to conducting veg-related research because there is issues with validity and reliability. So when you ask somebody how many servings of meat that they ate, there's a fairly good chance that they're not going to precisely remember exactly how much meat that they ate. And there's you know, a number of different ways that you can imagine asking the question. So the, the way that we asked it was in the past two days, how much, how much servings of X meat did you eat? But you can imagine asking in the past one week, in the past 30 days, you could ask them to keep a food diary. There's a number of different measures. And when people are recalling this information, they not only are likely to be inaccurate, there's also social desirability bias. So they know that we want them to report eating less meat. And it's difficult to assess the validity of these measures because it's almost impossible to measure the true amount of meat that people are eating. So there is some kind of truth out there. We know that you know, people are eating meat. There is some number of meat servings that people are eating. But in order to get that information, you have to get people to tell you how much they're eating, which, you know, then we fall into the area with all of the issues I just said. So, I mean, ideally you would, we would have a participant and we, um, you know, we would have uh, somebody spying on them essentially and recording down the meat that they're eating. So they're, they don't have to recall it themselves. They're, you know, they're not influenced or biased in any way. But I won't, don't need to go into the issues with that, that method. So self-reported diet measures, really difficult, one of our biggest challenges doing research. Secondly is the issue of power. So power is the idea that if there is a true effect in the population, if these ads are truly having an effect, or not even if they're truly having an effect, there is some effect that they're having on the population, whether that is you know, 5%, zero, or negative five. Power is the probability that we're going to detect that effect. So normally, um, you know, social science research, research, power studies at about 80%. So when I do my research, I'm 80%, you know, there's an 80% probability that I will detect an effect if that effect is there. That's um, confusing, but, you know, difficult concept to uh, describe. So in our study, depending on what comparison we were looking at, I showed you a lot of bar graphs, we had between 5 and 45% power, which means that in some respect, we only had a 5% chance of detecting, you know, the effect of the ad if that effect was actually there. And why it's so difficult to, to, to you know, to power a study like this and to power studies in the future is that we care about really small differences. So if, if people are reducing their meat by even 1%, we, 
we care about that really, really small number because our ads are deployed at such a high scale that it adds up really quickly. But to be able to de detect those really, really small differences, you need thousands and thousands and thousands of people up to hundreds of thousands, which means that these studies become very, very expensive very quickly. And that was one of the biggest lessons that we learned from this study, is that we wanted to replicate it, but it, you know, it might not be something that's at all possible because it becomes so expensive. So power is you know, something that, that we're always conscious of now um, and is you know, affected by the number of participants we have, the, how big the, the treatment effect is, so how strong is the treatment that we're using, and you know, how much variance is in the, the outcome measure. So again, the trouble with self-reported diet measures is there's a lot of variance in those measures in addition to the other issues, which means that, you know, that can also reduce power. So I would say moving forward, these are the two biggest issues um, that we need to solve with research moving forward in this area. And finally, I just wanted to touch on, even though th this study in particular didn't seem to find any meaningful differences between the two landing pages, there is the unmeasured impact of the ads that we didn't measure in this study. And that's that viewing the ads in Facebook without clicking on it can have an impact. So there was a study by Lewis and Riley at Yahoo where they found that um, up to, almost up to 80% of an increase in revenue was due to people who saw ads but didn't click on them. So people are seeing these ads in their Facebook, most people aren't clicking on them, but there's still a good chance that they're having an impact because people are seeing the picture, there's often you know, a title and a description talking about you know, the, the horrors of factory farming. And so seeing this ad in their feed could nudge them in a way that they would be more likely to you know, seek out some other resources. And that's it for me today. Of course, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, always willing to talk about this in more detail. Thank you. All right. So I'm Bobby. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University. And I'm going to talk about one of the studies we've just conducted, three-wave uh, MTurk experiment. I'm here representing the Animal Welfare Action Lab. Um, and shout out to my co-authors, Crystal, who just spoke, and then Greg Boise, who's, who's now working at ACE. Um, and of course, the, the, uh, Brian Kateman at the Reducetarian Foundation, who has supported this study, although the study was conducted independent of the Reducetarian Foundation, so that we would, uh, uh, of course, remain independent. OK, all right. So here's uh, one slide takeaway of what I'm going to talk about. So what we did is we conducted an MTurk experiment with 2,200 people where participants, we, we collected baseline data on meat consumption. A week later, we randomly assigned them to read one of three different news articles, uh, one with a, a reduced appeal, one with an, an eliminate appeal, and one that was just a control appeal. I'll say more about those in a second. Uh, we then measured meat consumption and attitudes five weeks after exposure to treatment. And overall, we find that both the reduce and the eliminate appeals led to substantial reductions in self-reported meat consumption on the order of about one serving per week, or about 6 or 7 percent. But there was no evidence of substantial differences between the effectiveness of the reduce appeal and the eliminate appeal. Okay, and these are the key figures. We're going to talk more about this in a second. All right, so the motivation for this study is pretty straightforward, that there is a growing literature on vegetarianism, studying the individual motivations to go vegetarian, the predictors of adopting a vegetarian diet, uh, reasons for vegetarian recidivism, et cetera, et cetera. But there's very little experimental research that examines the effectiveness of different interventions for changing individual meat consumption. So what we're focusing on in this study is, is when you vary one particular dimension of messaging strategy, what's the effect of that? 
So two research questions. First is, does reading a news article about factory farming inspire people to reduce their meat consumption? And then second, is it more effective to ask readers to stop eating meat entirely or ask them to simply reduce their meat consumption without eliminating it entirely? Okay, research design. Oh, nice formatting. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, week zero, we conduct a baseline survey of 3,000 people on MTurk. These are all done online. Week one, we expose people to a treatment, ask them to read the news article, uh, ask them to summarize it, and share one or two thoughts about it. And then five weeks later, we conduct an endline survey. Uh, 2,200 people completed the endline survey out of 3,000 people that started the study. So we, we uh, attrition, attrition was like 27.6%. Okay, three experimental arms. First is a control appeal. They read this article, which goes on further, talking about the benefits of walking. We shouldn't expect this to have any effect on meat consumption. The reduce appeal was a news article which focused on uh, using wording, suggesting that people reduce their meat consumption, but that they don't necessarily need to eliminate it entirely. And there were various aspects to this. We talked a little bit, or we, we mentioned, you know, the, the horrors of factory farming, uh, the health benefits of going vegetarian, sort of the typical stuff. But the, the, the key focus that is, the key aspect that's different from the third arm, which is the eliminate arm, is, is the size of the ask. So the, the final treatment arm was identical, except for slight changes in wording, where we were uh, Really, I mean, you can see the difference in the title where it's uh, rise of people pledging to become vegetarian versus reducitarian. It's kind of that, that style of changes in wording throughout the article. Okay. So that's what happened in the treatment wave. Let's talk a little bit about the baseline and endline surveys. Uh, we have a number of outcomes. The main outcomes we focused on were the number of servings of meat consumed in the past week where we use a food fre frequency questionnaire, which is on the right side here. Of course, you can't read the small font, but essentially people were asked to, to say how many times per, per week they eat each of the following foods. Uh, dairy, turkey, chicken, vegetables, fruit, etc. And then we summed that up to get a, a count of the number, the self-reported number of servings of meat consumed in the past week. Uh, we also measure attitudes towards factory farming on a 1 to 7 scale. I'll talk more about the specific measures. And then we've got a, a number of secondary outcomes also generally measured on like a 1 to 7 scale or 1 to, one to 10 scale. We'll get into that in a second. Hey, for those of you who care, uh, we're going to estimate treatment effects simply by a difference in means. So this is, this is the standard like difference in means estimator and a linear regression framework, and we're getting power out of using these block dummies on the right-hand side. If that means nothing to you, don't worry about it. The whole point is that since we randomly assign people to the different treatment arms, we can simply look at the difference in means. And the parameters we're interested in here are, are these, these, these tau's. Okay, so before I actually show those treatment effects, uh, let's just look at the raw data. So this is the raw data. On uh, the left-hand column is the, the count the number of self-reported meat servings just measured at end line. So on average, and uh, sorry, the rows are the different treatment groups. So this is essentially the raw data, the raw outcome, outcome data. So you can see that uh, on the, the, the left column that the, these distributions are sort of centered around 16, 17 servings of meat per week. The right-hand side is the self-reported change between baseline and end line. So we simply subtract, you know, time, time one minus time zero. And here we can see that most people are reporting zero change. You see the spike, the spike right at zero. But what we're interested in is whether this, the blue distribution on the bottom and the green distribution in the middle are shifted to the left, as in people are reporting that they reduce their meat consumption relative to the distribution on the top where people are, are reporting very little change. That's what we're interested in. And here's the, the, the the difference in means across groups taking it from these distributions. So let, let me stop and explain these properly. So the, I mean, our y-axis here, I guess I have a, okay. So, so the y-axis, we got the, the reduce condition and the eliminate condition. And the top panel is gonna be the, 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 the variable we're looking at is the total number of servings of meat 
reported just at end line. In the bottom panel, we're going to look at the effect on the change in reported meat, servings of meat consumed uh, between time one and time two. So the, the, the coefficients that we're showing here, they're all to the left of zero, meaning that relative to the control group, in both the reduced and the eliminate arms, people were reporting consuming less meat. On the order of about, so when we look at the bottom panel, we're looking on the order of about one serving of meat less consumed than, than what was reported in the control group. Okay. However, we do not see the same kinds of treatment effects on intentions, self-reported intentions to change meat consumption. For here, the, the effects of the eliminate and the reduce appeals on changes in intentions are virtually zero, suggesting the importance of asking about behavior rather than intentions. Moving on to, oh, let's break it down quickly by, by each of the, the different categories. So, Overall, I've shown that there is, there was a significant decrease in self-reported meat consumption, but breaking it down by animal product, we don't have the statistical power to examine or to, to see exactly which animal products decreased in particular. So, like, there's some evidence that the, the decrease, the overall decrease in meat consumption looks like it was mostly due, like, to a combination of fish, a little bit of pork, and chicken, but these 95% confidence intervals are all overlapping zero, so it, it's not clear precisely exactly which, which categories of meat were, were most effective. Okay, effects on attitudes. So, so here, uh, each of the panels shows the effects on a, on a different attitude that we measured. Top left is we asked people about whether they believe that eating meat contributes to animal suffering. We ask people about whether animals have a good standard of living on factory farms. We ask people whether they think that eating meat contributes to environmental degradation. We ask people about whether uh, eating less meat uh, makes you healthier. And on all of, these, all of these, we're seeing significant effects that people in the reduce and eliminate conditions were more likely to say that eating meat contributes to suffering and all these other things. We did not see any effects, however, on a feeling thermometer measure towards vegetarians. So it didn't make people feel any more positively or, or provide more positive assessments of vegetarians themselves, but they did seem to update their perceptions of the well-being of animals on factory farms. Okay. Uh, last part here is that uh, it, did, it, did, it did seem to increase Americans' perceptions of how many Americans are reducing their meat consumption, or perceptions of the descriptive norms of what's going on in society, which is interesting as well. Okay, so these are the headline findings, that there were significant effects on meat consumption and there were significant, significant effects on attitudes. Other things, there were less clear results. So we also measured whether people seem to seek out more information or have more discussions about factory farming, meat consumption, et cetera, after being exposed to the treatments. And here, uh, the top panel is showing people's reported number of uh, pieces of media consumed, videos, uh, news articles, whatever. And there's, there's some weak evidence that they increased the, the number of pieces of media they exposed themselves to, but, but not strong evidence. On the bottom panel, we're showing people's self-reported number of discussions they had over the past month about factory farming, et cetera. And there we're seeing some, some positive effects on the order. Like, on average, people in the treatment groups had like 0.15 more discussions, which when you divide that by like, so like out of 800 people, 80, 80 people had an additional discussion, I guess would be sort of the, the takeaway from that. Okay, uh, no effects on perceptions of animal intelligence across the board. Uh, maybe, maybe some small uh, evidence that they think humans are less intelligent. <laughs> but, but given all the, the hypotheses that we're testing here, I mean, I would, you, don't, you don't put any weight on that. Okay. And then finally, we looked at it, whether the, the treatment conditions influenced people's perceptions of how difficult it is to reduce human consumption. And here, we didn't see any strong evidence of people's uh, perceptions of how easy it is. 
in the articles, we did have a sentence, one sentence on, on you know, tofu is more available than ever, it's easier than ever to go vegetarian, but that doesn't seem to have resonated with people. Perhaps that's something we could have elaborated on. Okay, so those are the takeaway findings. Now, you may have a few concerns about the study. Uh, one is that since there was some attrition between time one and time two, even though we randomized the treatments, attrition could lead to compositional differences in the treatment groups versus the control groups, leading to confounding or bias in our estimated treatment effects. And here uh, we can show in balance tables that there's, there's no, when we just focus on the people who completed all three waves, there's no, there's no uh, differences across groups in pretreatment covariates or pretreatment outcomes. So this isn't a concern. These are the balance tables. Don't worry about them. Uh, <laughs> they're fine. Trust me. Uh, okay, second is that I just showed you a lot of results. We tested a lot of hypotheses here. And for psychologists in the room especially, there's many concerns about p-hacking and multiple, multiple hypothesis testing. So p-values are invalid, or the typical p-values we show are invalid when you're testing multiple hypotheses. But our results are robust to using p-value corrections uh, where we put a constraint on the weighted false discovery rate. Again, uh, trust me, or, or you can replicate our results and look at it yourself. Okay, last thing, and perhaps most important, is social desirability bias. And here we think there are three reasons that social desirability bias is not going to be a big concern for our study. Number one is that since we measured outcomes five weeks after exposure to treatment versus, say, one day after or, after, or in, the same, in the same survey itself, this would re require people to make the link five weeks after between what they read and then what we're asking them about quite a bit uh, later. And these are MTurkers who do a lot of studies I mean, on a daily basis, that they're, they're doing a lot of this stuff, so I'd be surprised. Okay. A couple of other reasons is that we don't observe large effects on other variables that we would expect to be affected by social desirability, like the perceptions of animal intelligence. And we also don't observe effects on some sort of placebo outcomes. Like, we don't observe people saying that they, they, they intend to change their fruit or veg consumption, which also might be affected by social desirability, but was not mentioned in the treatments. Okay. Wrapping up, uh, a couple avenues for further research is that, I mean, we're, we'd be interested in longer term effects. We'd be great to have behavioral measures rather than self-reported behavior. Uh, we need field experiments in this area, that this study was still an online survey experiment where people knew that they were participating in a study, et cetera. And the last thing are the practical Im implications. So to sum up, like there was, so we saw significant effects, significant reductions in the consumption of meat, but what do you do with this as an animal advocate? A uh, few quick questions you might have. One is that are reduce appeals more effective than eliminate appeals? And based on what I've shown you, there's no evidence for that. Even though both seem to be effective relative to a control message. Second, well, that's, that's um, more or less along the same lines. Okay, last thing is a question of whether the effects of these reduce and eliminate appeals are likely to be similar in mediums other than news articles. So you might be interested in using these uh, in leaflets and online ads, et cetera, and that's something that we don't have any evidence, or this study doesn't speak to that because we only conducted it on the medium of, of news articles, and so that's an area for further research. And with that, I'll wrap it up here. All of the, the data and code is online for people who want to replicate it on GitHub. And uh, feel free to reach out. And I'll leave it there. Great. So it's awesome to be with these pioneers in their field. And we get the opportunity to ask them a few questions before lunch. Um, does anyone have one to open up with? Oh, hi, this is Kelsey from Mercy for Animals again. This is fascinating. And um, one thing as a fundraiser that I would love to see, because we're so, it's so important to bring new donors into our movement and increase the amount of donations coming to our movement, is to do a study like this directed you know, towards philanthropists or towards meat-eating philanthropists to see if we can somehow affect them and sway them into coming into our fold. So um, just wanted to throw that out there as 
potential future study or um, and and was curious if if you had any plans in that direction or uh, could speak to that. So is the, is the question is the question about uh, you're, you're wondering like what are effective ways to get the media to cover these stories? Was that what it was? No, I guess Uh, right. Yeah, that would be a fascinating. Uh, no, we haven't we haven't done anything along those lines, but it would certainly be interesting to target it to particular populations and 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 see whether there there are different effects. I could say quickly that we didn't see any significant differences in the size of treatment effects across different age groups or across male and female. But of course, we don't have uh, uh, that particular population in our sample that we could look at. Uh, hi, Hal. Hal Hers, I'm a psychologist, and this is uh, to Crystal. Um, it seems to me that there's a sort of a paradox that you, in, 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 the, in the work here. And it's this, you know, uh, statistical power has become a big issue in the sciences because weak statistical power means a lot of results are invalid. So you need a hunk of a lot of subjects. And what you were interested in, I think correctly, is small, small effects. And you say small effects are important, and they really are. But almost by definition, you can't pick up those small effects and produce re valid results. So how do we make sense of that? Does that make sense? Definitely. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I mean, so one of the, the um, you know, ways that we're not really getting around it, more, but more like trying to avoid it, is to do studies with treatments and populations that we think we can see an effect with. Um, so the, the MTurk studies that um, Bobby talked about and other ones that I've done several at MFA, they seem to be a lot more successful at detecting effect sizes. Um, but these kind of large scale, um, you know, the ad study that I outlined or, you know, doing a leafleting study, these, these studies where it's, you know, you're, you're throwing a lot out there and you're hoping that, you know, some of these ads or some of the leaflets stick. Um, it seems to be larger scale studies like that that we're having the biggest issue with. But at the same time, those are the topics that are really important to assess because those are, those are some of the main interventions. So it's not really a, an answer to, to your question, but it's that, you know, we're still working on, on finding ways to measure those interventions. Meanwhile, um, you know, doing the types of studies that we know we can do and get valid results. Hi. Um, I have a question. I'm a little bit confused about the reason why men were included in the veg leaflet. Because from what I understood, it was because of common sense. But, like, well, it's a man will pick it up and put it down. Maybe a teenager will pick it up, pick it up and put it down. Or a child will pick it up and put it down. Um, so I'm, I'm just interested in what drove the decision to include men, if there was any research or any studies that yeah, drove that decision. So yeah, so the, the version that John showed was created before Crystal or I were at Mercy for Animals. Um, the reason for including it was, yeah. <laughs> do you like that? Um, there was, there, we didn't do a study where we showed groups one versus the other and looked at the impact. We didn't do that. It really was just based on the, the same lines of thinking of what John expressed, is that, yes, women are about three times more likely than men to go vegetarian or to go vegan, and they're also more likely to reduce their meat consumption. But a lot of our audience is men, and we figured that including some men to make them roughly proportional to, to their representation in the vegetarian vegan population would probably not have a big downside on uh, female viewers and hopefully would help it ma seem more palatable and um, understandable for male viewers. So no, but no, we did not do any research to test whether one was better than the other, but it's an interesting idea. Hi, um, I have a question about how you choose to communicate about your research. Um, and so here's a common uh, kind of paradigm for uh, how I've seen research communicated in the animal advocacy community. Um, someone does like an MTurk study or a leafletting study, then um, 
they write up like a blog post or a short post, and then they blast out uh, like a one sentence um, summary. You should do this. You should use this kind of messaging. You should uh, change how your practices in this way. Um, and I'm wondering if that uh, kind, if if you choose, if you all choose to communicate differently in light of other findings, like um, in psychology, there's this re reproducibility project um, from the recent past where. Uh, a number of psychologists tested a hundred highly regarded and, and uh, widely cited psychology findings and found that two thirds didn't replicate. Um, so, to the extent that um, there's the, the same problem could exist in this case, do you choose to, or I mean, how do you choose to uh, communicate with the proper qualifications about how activists should uh, use the research? As, as, a research, as a researcher, I mean, I, I can sort of cop out and say, yeah, please just, I mean, go and reproduce the study, do it a bunch of times before we draw conclusions, uh, but that's not very satisfying to animal advocates. Yeah, so I'd have two answers to that. Um, <laughs> so I have two, two answers, and this is a, definitely an important question. So the first answer is that with what we're doing, I, I guess not every study that anyone here has done or that might get referenced this weekend, but certainly with a lot of the work that we as animal advocates are doing, um, we're, looking for, we're not looking to prove certain scientific facts, right? So we're not looking to prove that uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that something happens. We're looking for probabilities. And so if we can find that some, like using X wording, like using reduce message versus an eliminate message, if we find evidence to suggest that, it's more, that one is more likely to work, that gives those of us who are doing this work something to act on. Um, it's something to take into consideration when we decide how to design videos and websites and printed materials and press releases and things like that. It doesn't require, you know, co complete confidence in it. It's just a piece of information that it's better to have than not have. That at least one study or two studies found that this is more likely to help, likely to be better than this other approach. So that's, that's, that's one thought. The other thought is that, you know, we're all chatting about, about doing research and the importance of research. One, I think the biggest problem with research is not uh, necessarily on the, the execution side. Obviously, it's very important, and that'll be the subject of a lot of discussion. It's on really the political side of how do we get the organizations that have a lot of money that are doing all this work to actually make physical, tangible changes in what they're doing. That is really difficult. So the sad reality is that, that most research that gets done, no one reads it. Um, and of the, the research that does get read, if it doesn't have very actionable uh, results and suggestions of do X, not Y, it's unlikely to be acted on by people in these organizations who are controlling these budgets and doing these programs. And so one of the things that at Mercy for Animals we've tried to do is we've tried to, uh, you know, when we share these results publicly, we share all the data um, so that those who are more research minded and want to take a more critical look and might want to redo the studies, which we hope they do, uh, can see all that raw data, can look through all of that, and can draw the more sophisticated, nuanced, nuanced conclusions. But for the people who are most important, which are the people running the, the small number of animal advocacy organizations who we hope to actually influence their behavior with these results, we hope to get them to use these results, I think it's really important to give them very clear, very simple messages of do this this is likely to be helpful or this may be helpful, or the research found this may be helpful, um, to narrow the focus and to, to help them make these changes. That same sort of mentality, of course, we wrap into, the same sort of mentality that we use when trying to get people to change their diet or to vote a certain way. Focus attention, concrete message, something tangible. I think we need to use that when we're communicating research results if we want organizations to actually make improvements and changes to what they're doing. Because all of us, even hopefully, Smart people like Crystal and I who work at these organizations, we all have inertia bias, right? We need to get past that to get others to, to make these changes. So that's why Mercy for Animals takes the approach that we take in communicating the results of our research to, to others. We're afraid we only have time for one more last question. How are you doing? I'm Garrett Broad. I'm a professor at Fordham University in New York City. Um, my question is mostly for Nick and Crystal. Um, Nick, you give this really convincing argument about um, the value of A-B testing to get more eyeballs, basically, right? And, and demonstrating how you're able to get these videos to so many more people. But then we have a kind of different story from Crystal, which is, which is to say, once we get these eyeballs, we're not sure how much it's actually getting people in terms of those outcome behaviors that we're interested in. Uh, 
speaking specifically about reducing consumption or going vegetarian. So I'm wondering how do we kind of square that circle? In one sense, it's maybe a promising story about ways to get more eyeballs on this, but a discouraging story at the same time about once we have these eyeballs, does it actually make that change? So how has Mercy for Animals sort of thought through the contradictions there and, and ways to get more effective in, in making sure those eyeballs lead to actual change? Sure. So obviously we're doing both of those because of the most, both important. So one thing to note is that the study that Crystal described didn't test the impact of people who pledge to go vegetarian and get resources and get emails and get support. It didn't test that. Um, only a tiny percentage, less than 2% of the, the visitors in the experimental group actually were in that pledge condition. So um, that study that Crystal described didn't touch on what happens to people after they pledge, after with their email address. So in terms of assuming that's valuable, yeah, we're just assuming. We're assuming that getting people on our email list, giving them a veg starter guide, giving them emails, giving them personal support, we assume that all of those things are good, good for changing their diet, good for getting some of them to be donors, some of them to be volunteers, et cetera. It's, com it's completely an assumption. We, we intend to do a test at some point on the impact of that specific uh, feature or program. But yeah, it's just working on that assumption that we think those things are probably useful. But yeah, to your point, this is definitely why it's important to do both sides of that equation. Okay, um, great, so we're about to eat lunch. Um, thank you all so much. Let's give one round of applause to our speakers.